good, good morning, everybody. Uh, I get the uh, great honor of introducing our forum speaker today. The Reverend Lee Harding is the Director of Pastoral Care um, for the United Methodist Homes Hilltop Campus. Has been for over 20 years. So if there's anybody who knows about the spiritual needs of the elderly, I think she's got a handle on it. And, uh, and so uh, with no further ado, Lee, it's all yours. Thank you. So when I think of the spiritual needs of the elderly, um, I can't separate them from just the needs of the elderly. And, and the needs of the elderly, the basic needs are the same as the needs for all of us. You know, we all need a roof over our heads. We all need food. We all need clean air, clean water. So what's the difference between the needs that we have and the needs for the elderly? So the need for a um, shelter, our basic bottom line for folks at Hilltop and Elizabeth Church Manor is safety. You know, is an individual safe where they are? And so what are those things? When I say safety, what kinds of things you come to your mind immediately? Stairs. Stairs. Are they safe in their home? Able to do stairs. Um, my own mo mother is now living at Hilltop and stairs was part of the issue. Um, just watching her navigate. Uh, Phyllis's mom moved from an apartment at Hilltop where she needed to use stairs to one that she no longer needs to use stairs. So yes, the ability to walk up and down stairs is one. What's another? Throw rugs. Throw rugs. Yeah, we have a throw rug, rug right here on the floor. Elgin rug. Oh, it's not going to be very much. It's our Elgin rug. When at Hilltop, we used to have a safety uh, gentleman, Jack, who's since retired. And since he's retired, um, independent folks, more and more, I'm seeing more and more of these throw rugs on top of carpets. And they are indeed a tripping hazard, whether we want, uh, but they look so nice. Yeah. I know they look nice, but are they necessarily safe? And the answer is probably not for any of us. Are they safe? Okay, what else? Showers and bathtubs. Showers and bathtubs, yeah. Uh, very definitely. So how do we make them safe? Add, add grab bars, add shower chairs. You know, there's ways to make those safe. Um, some people walk change them to walk-ins. Yeah, so you don't have to step up over the rim. Yep. Uh, at Hilltop, most of the independent showers have now been changed to the walk-in type. And we still have some folks who prefer to hire uh, an aide to be there when they, when they bathe, just in case. All right. What else in safety in the home? Cooking. Cooking. Leaving things on the stove. Leaving things on the stove, putting things in the microwave for too long. Um, Let's see, cooking. Boiling water, anytime you're cooking with hot stuff, that's Lifting always a danger in any kitchen. <clears throat> yeah, more so if you're unsteady and you're trying to carry something, right? Um, oh, or you forget it's cooking, that's right. Right. Uh, the residents at Hilltop are amazed to find out how sensitive the smoke alarms and uh, heat detectors actually are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's when you burn the popcorn, burn popcorn. popcorn and the fire alarm goes off. Well, a lady a couple of weeks ago, it was a hot dog. She was frying it in a frying pan. I suggest that perhaps next time you either boil it or just put it in the microwave for 30 seconds and it'll be good. But um, yeah, it's amazing how sensitive. And a couple of times we've gotten there, we, there are two stages. There's a yellow stage, which is a warning. And if you get the room number, you can go to the room number, hopefully catch it before it goes to a full blown alarm. I've had people say, how did you know? Uh, <laughs> well, there's, there's a panel and you the room number and yeah. so cooking. How about um, what to do in an emergency? I've got the call button for 
at Hilltop, you've got a call button, but if you're in your own home, you may or may not. You may have one of those uh, link to life buttons that you can push, but you may not. And one of our biggest question is, if there were a fire, would you know what to do? And if the answer is no, then perhaps you shouldn't be living in your own home anymore by yourself. You could still be in your own home, but maybe with some assistance, maybe with someone checking on periodically. So safety, as far as shelter goes, is um, of primary importance. Okay, so you come to a place like Hilltop, and it, it's much safer in many ways because there's more people around on a general basis. Um, but even I discovered during COVID, <laughs> um, as I watched the restrictions come into place, I, I saw the spirit of people plummet. Why? What is it that happened during COVID that um, throughout the entire facility, and I mean independent to every level of care in the main building, no visitors were absolutely permitted for weeks and months on end. And how many of you, I mean, yes, uh, many stayed home for those weeks and months on end, but how many of you could still have visitors in your own home? You could. Um, our kitchen was renovated during COVID and we even had a workman come in, what, May of that first year? Is that he, when he came in and hung the, the cupboards? Mm -hmm. That wouldn't necessarily happen at Hilltop. And I watched as people in their internal spirit, and you could just see it written on their face as the days went into weeks, went into months, when they couldn't meet with their loved ones in their, quote, own home. And I mean, I, I understand where CDC was coming from in New York State Health Department, but I also saw the toll that it took emotionally. And for me, when I think about the spiritual needs of the elderly, the, the biggest factor for me is that spirit, that persona, that, and I turn to Psalm 71, verse 9 in particular, 9 and 18. Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. For my enemies speak against me. Those who wait to kill me conspire together. And then verse 18, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Um, the restrictions during COVID made people feel like they'd been forgotten. You know, that very thing that the Psalm speaks about, they're old, remembering me to old age. So what do you do? We've got the state rules. We've got the people who want to see their loved ones. So they started creating ways to see each other. Zoom being one of them. Um, our as seniors learned more about FaceTime, <laughs> Zoom, and um, other forms of communicating with their loved ones um, via electronic devices than they ever did before. For some of them, it was like, oh my gosh, if my family lives so far away. I only get to see them in person like once a year, maybe twice a year. This allowed them to see their loved ones almost every week or daily if they wanted to. So for some, it was absolutely open the windows and it, it, it make that connection that they hadn't had in years. Um, for others, it was less than satisfactory. Um, for some, particularly those with dementia, as you can well imagine, they couldn't grasp the concept of how somebody on that machine could be talking to them. It, it, it wasn't 
it clearly isn't the same as someone being right there in the room, but magnify that with the confusion of, uh, of dementia. And it just, and it got to the point where our folks were saying, I don't care about this COVID thing. I really don't care if I get sick. I want to see my loved ones. So finally, they allowed us then to have visitors, but with a lot of restrictions. And the first restriction was they could visit as long as there was a barrier between the person who was visiting and the person who was visited, a physical barrier. We made the, our maintenance department made these booths that if I put them together, it reminded me of a dunk tank. <laughs> <laughs> so picture half a dunk tank with this glass surrounding plexiglass surrounding it and a little shelf on the inside and the visitor sat on the outside and the resident sat on the inside and we had little speakers a microphone so they could talk to one another in our large auditorium but the visits were supervised oh gosh uh, when I think about the things that we did and how dehuman, dehumanizing mm -hmm. it really was, um, you know, supervise it, no physical contact. If you brought a gift for our resident, you give the gift to the staff person who then gives the gift to the resident. But, you know, I'm like, wow. Um, again, they were thrilled to be able to see each other. But at, at what toll, at what cost? We've, we've gotten past that. The uh, dunking tank booths are gone. Um, family members can now visit in the rooms. For the independent folks, there are absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. Our independent folks can wear a mask if they want to, but they don't have to. Um, the state has finally come to the conclusion that our independent folks are truly, guess what, independent. Yeah. And you do what you would do in the community, just like here in this room, some are wearing masks, some are not. Um, and it's how many visitors you have in your room it no longer has to do with the square footage and being able to stay six feet apart. It's how many people you want in your room. On our assisted living, the restriction is two visitors in each person's room. And that's because of the size of the rooms, the square footage, and being able to still socially distance. If they have additional visitors beyond that too, we can set them up in a larger room where it, the, the expectation is they will socially distance themselves. Um, it's no longer monitored, however. Do I know if people are socially distancing themselves? I, I, I really don't care. That's right. I'm at the point where I just really don't care. Um, at the nursing home, you were asking about visiting at the nursing home. To visit at the nursing home, still to this day, a visitor, every visitor who walks in the door at Hilltop or in the, in the nursing homes in the area have to have a COVID test within 24 hours. Yeah. And now that the home tests are as available as they are, they are encouraging people to do the test at home, bring the little box with you, the little square thing that you take the test and demonstrate that it indeed was a clean um, COVID test and it gets thrown away right there on site. If you don't have access to them, um, we are, I don't know if others are providing the tests, give it to you, take it out to your car do your little test 15 minutes later, you can come in. Okay. Yeah. Other places are too. Okay. Um, how long that will continue to be? I don't know. Um, the staff, we are all vaccinated. We had to be the new, you know, mandate for New York state um, healthcare workers and for the nursing home only, you're gonna love this one, because I'm over the age of 50, I've had to get the boosters or agree to be tested twice weekly. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a decision each individual makes and each one of us has made a different decision. Some say, I'm not getting poked any more times than I have to. If they say I have to be tested twice a week, that's on them, okay. 
And I'm more of the mind of, I don't really want to be tested twice a week, take the time out of my schedule, forget it. I'll just go ahead and get the vaccine and be done with it. And then I can forget it. Um, the one thing we've learned about the vaccines, obviously, is that they weren't as effective at preventing the disease as we all hoped it would be. Yes, the initial intent we kept hearing was slow the curve, slow the curve, slow, you know, flatten the curve. It did do that. And in that way, it's been great. Um, I don't know what to tell you about the vaccines anymore, though, on their effectiveness. I really don't. Um, you know, it's, it's clearly a personal choice in between you and your, your own physicians. Um, spiritual needs of the elderly. Going back to that one. What are, can you think of some other needs that might be different for the elderly than for uh, someone who's in their 20s? They can't, they can't come to a service that you do in the auditorium, can they? Yes, they can now. Um, I am doing services again. Um, I have on Sunday afternoons, three different services. Um, at three o'clock, I have the assisted living first and second floor. They come for service and I have about 15 people there. At four o'clock, I'm on our early stage dementia unit and have service there with another about 15 to 20 people. And then at 6.30 in the main auditorium, I have service for the independent folks. And then during the week, that service is then repeated on the late stage dementia unit and unit two in the nursing home. So yeah, they could come to service now and Catholic mass is back. Um, we have a priest who comes in. Now it's for Catholic mass, the priest is not going to the nursing home. The Catholic Mass is for independent and assisted living only. And finally, I think two months ago, we started combining uh, assisted living and independent folks together in the same room. It's the one time that independent folks don't have a say on whether they wear masks. If they are mixed with assisted, they have to be masked. And that's because of the rules for assisted, not because of independent. So yeah, they are beginning to bring more and more people together. They're still small. They're still smaller groups than what they had been, but we are gradually beginning to bring um, different parts of the campus together again for the first time. When you say independent, you're meaning the Highlands and the East Side? Uh-huh. Okay. And Sunset Heights. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Anyone who by definition is independent. Um, so yeah, being able to get out to worship services uh, when all of COVID hit and all the churches in the area closed and all the services went online to zoom, that was great for folks like you here at Trinity. You could get your weekly service, just log into your computers or on your televisions and, you know, the convenience of your own home. And then we got thinking about it for our folks at Hilltop. We, we debated about whether or not to try to have a service that would be broadcast and concluded that our residents are not as up to date on the electronics as uh, we might have hoped. Some of the more recent independent folks would be, but my folks who are 90 and 100, uh, no, not so much. And so we decided to stay in contact with folks the old fashioned way. And I sent out weekly a brief uh, suggested scripture reading, which I took from the lectionary, uh, my meditation, which was a shortened version of any sermon I would have given, a prayer for the week, and then on the back side of that paper, um, a, generally a um, word find puzzle that I put together using words from the scripture. I did that for two years. Close to it. Yeah, close mm -hmm. to it. She was my proofreader. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, and you recently did it again when there was an outbreak and, and you couldn't yes. see service. I've just done oh, it again yeah. recently when we have an outbreak on uh, a particular unit and that unit is closed down. Um, a lot of things have changed in how uh, COVID is handled. At one time, if, if an individual uh, got COVID, they were isolated on a particular wing or a particular floor, and we no longer have to do that. They can uh, isolate in their room. 
um, they don't have to be moved away from their peers. Um, so, How but does that affect um, um, after hospitalization when a person is readmitted? Is there any in, on that now? In the nursing home, the, um, yes, they restrict, but it's not for 14 days anymore. It's the lesser time. Yeah. Um, what, what about the need to feel useful? There we go. Oh, the need to feel useful. How often in our society do we, uh, and when someone say, introduce yourself, and you're introduced almost exclusively by your name and what you do. What do you do when you're no longer working? How do you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm retired. Yeah, but then what happens when you get to be 80 or 90 and, you know, what do you do? Well, I don't, I don't do anything. Um, you say retired and then what you did. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. I'm retired and this is what I did. Uh, that's true. My folks... And then the, you, for, for people who are still active in the community, it still is pretty easy. Oh, I'm retired, but I still stay active doing volunteering for this organization or that organization, or um, I've taken a part-time job to make, help make ends meet. You know, there's still a lot of, but then you get to the point where you, you can't even get out there and volunteer a lot. So my folks are saying, how many times I've heard it, I'm just a burden to my family. Just let me go. I'm nothing but a burden. And my response, again, I go back to scriptures, it's faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of them is love. If you are capable of loving and you're capable of being loved, that's all the purpose in life we have to have. That's all that, that really matters in the spiritual sense is that ability to love and be loved. And even when an individual is no longer visibly to love, there is still that connection with their loved ones, if you want to use that word, their loved ones, that is very clear when a loved one will walk into a room or someone they know and appreciate, um, even in the deepest recesses of dementia. Um, so that ability to love and be loved is really all that matters. And the hardest part is getting people to, to really, I can't say buy into that. That's not quite the, the right thing, but to realize that indeed that is enough. That is enough. Um, yeah. I think one of the hard things, whether one is in a facility or not, is the continuous loss of friends and family um, just disappearing. You sort of wonder, why am I still here? I, I read the obituaries. Now look at the age. <laughs> you yeah, don't no. Oh, good. <clears throat> They're all older than I am. Or, oh, wow. You know, there's 10 here today that are much younger than I am. It's just crazy. And, and, and then you try to remember, did so-and-so die? I think they did. Oh, yeah. There's sometimes a, a, a celebrity will pass away. Phil will be like, oh, were they still alive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I think you feel almost guilty uh, sometimes. Well, the one thing about loss. Yeah, the one thing about death is that death is no respecter of age That's right. at all, ever. Never has been, never will be. Um, you know, how many times have we heard of the death of a child, even in utero? When I was doing hospital chaplaincy, a full time, um, a full term mother felt her baby moving and then later that afternoon the baby had stopped moving and sure enough the umbilical cord had gotten wrapped around the child's neck the child did not survive and that was my first awakening you know I was in seminary and how you approach somebody with the fact that death can come to any of us anytime the next hour for us is not guaranteed for any one of us and yes, we get to a certain age where we start reading those obituaries and start looking at age. But the truth is, those have always been there. You know, it's nothing new. We're just much more attuned to it and aware of it. And our folks in the, the home, 
again, when COVID came about and these restrictions went into place, they were like, you know, I'm 96 years old. I don't care if I get COVID and die. I've lived a good long life. I really don't care. And truthfully, I finally came to the conclusion they really didn't. They really didn't. What they cared about was that love that they wanted to experience face to face with their loved ones and that they wanted a hug from their loved one. Just like I could go to my mother's house without a mask on because she was still living in her own home and give my mother that hug with, I saw some places where they put up these sheets or plastic and you, uh, they were hug sheets or something and you're to hug between. It's not the same. It's just not the same. Um, you know, I even still see the little circles on the floor of six feet of distance and how many of us are totally ignoring those at this point in banks and stores and wherever, you know, we, we've all, I'm past that. I'm just so past that. Um, yeah. So for some of my residents, I'm thinking of one gentleman now who actually just passed away this last week. And I had a conversation with him about a month or so ago. And he was, how did he describe it? A non-practicing Catholic or a lapsed Catholic, whichever word you wanted to use. And he said, you're not like any other minister I've ever met. I usually take that as a compliment. So. <laughs> Um, he had been hurt by the church. And it, when somebody says that to me about being a lapsed, whatever, my first thought is, so how were they hurt by the church? And sure enough, um, an incident had happened in his life. And he was now, he's wondering, does, does God even remember who I am? Mm. Yeah. And it goes back to that Psalm. Do not forget me in my old age. And don't you find that with a lot of the residents, even if they may be continuing church members, that there's that, that, that fear of being forgotten? Oh, yeah. Whether by God or by everybody else. Right. right. Um, when. And how do I say this? When, let's say, even a. Um, a building is named after somebody. How many years is it before the vast majority of people have forgotten who that person even is? I was at BOCES about a few weeks ago uh, doing a presentation to the nursing students there. And I, I used to teach there. Before I went into ministry, I was a special education teacher and I taught at the BOCES building. And I was very pleased to see as I walked in that the building is now the name, the Dr. Uh, Leslie Diston Education Center. Dr. Diston was the superintendent when I taught at Bosey's. Yeah. Dr. Diston lives across the street from Hilton. Yes. Okay. His wife had been on um, in our nursing home. And I walked in and I said to the security guard, oh, I see uh, your building's named after Dr. Dixon or Diston. He said, oh yeah, he's, he passed away. And I said, oh no, he isn't. Oh no, 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 he isn't. He is very much alive. So I thought, wow, if even the security doesn't know. Well, then I found out he was a new security guard, hadn't been there all that long. The name meant absolutely nothing to him. So then I went into the nursing class and I mentioned something to them about being forgotten. I said, so how many of you know Dr. Leslie Diston? They go, who? I said, it's on the sign outside. It is. They said they hadn't even noticed it. I'm like, wow. Wow. I mean, here's a guy who's not been retired all that long, really. Relatively speaking. He's still alive. He is still alive. But how quickly people are forgotten. And, you know, the Decker Center at uh, the university, how many people still know who the Deckers were? <sighs> wow. So keeping that alive and people still wanting to be remembered even 
after they're gone. There, there's that desire to want to be remembered. And we do things so that in part we will be remembered. Um, so I've learned um, when we have a resident at Hilltop who's lost a loved one through the years is to make sure I periodically bring up their name to say their name if I can remember it. I'll even sometimes go look it up to make sure I get it right. Uh, we have one lady whose daughter was injured um, in the Pentagon in 2001 um, on 9-11. And 9-11 happened on a Sunday this year. So I went to her apartment and just said, I'm remembering with you today. Um, it's those kinds of things that it's amazing how important those are to just not being afraid to say the name of somebody who was important in their life to help that memory be kept so that they know that they're being remembered by more than just their mother. Yeah. I think it's very important too to, to teach this to staff. Yes. To become extended family. Yes. And I always used to be offended when I heard my staff refer to somebody as honey or dearie. Oh boy. They are not either one. No. Or Mrs. or Mr. or God. Or whatever name they wish to be called. Yeah. By. And that um, we still fight that every day. Yeah. It's 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 not uncommon. No. But so many of the residents look forward to the interaction that they have with staff because of a lot of the things that you've already said relative to isolation because of COVID or mm -hmm. distance or something mm -hmm. like that. But no, don't call me honey. Yeah, don't call me honey or dearie. If I even go into a restaurant, I get upset when the waitress refers to me as honey. Or, it's like, I'm not your honey. I'm not your dear. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and if it bothers me that much there, you can imagine um, how much it would bother me. And yet, yeah, it doesn't matter. It seems to, it doesn't matter how many in services we have on it. I still hear it periodically and it just jerks me every single time. I had a, a lady, excuse me, but I had a lady mm -hmm. who was elderly and we had um, uh, CNA, nursing assistant, big, tall African American man who was just, everybody wished that he would care for them because oh, wow. it was so good. Mm -hmm. Well, he had this one woman who he, had a real attachment to, and she wasn't called honey or dearie. She was called queenie. Oh, there you go. For my queenie. So <laughs> that was not an insult. That was right at all. But Nicknames are acceptable. Mm -hmm. and very definitely. I have a lady right now that I call Tulip. In fact, she's in my cell phone as Tulip. Um, it's just something that's gotten started between the two of us. And that's perfectly acceptable, but I don't go around calling everybody tulip right? any more than go around calling everybody queenie. It's just not going to happen. Um, and I think that's the difference is that's a nickname for that individual. And it connects, I, makes I, that I, connection. Identifies their relationship. Mm -hmm. I think. More so than just blatantly calling everybody blanketly calling everybody honey or dearie. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And if he's the only one who called that lady that, and that was acceptable to her, that's actually a form of endearment. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was. So you oh, absolutely that nickname instead of right. Mrs. So and So, which it seems rather cold. Ever can. Well, you say, here comes Kingston with Queenie. Here she comes. Here she comes. Yep. Yeah. She was lovely. So, what are some other? spiritual me uh oh i one of the things that came up in seminary as i was again starting with hospital chaplaincy are the things that have happened in an individual's life that the individual thought they had dealt with and had put behind them but now as they're getting into their elder years those things are coming back um the woman who had an abortion and never told anybody you know, the woman who, before it was socially acceptable, had had a divorce and had never told anybody. Um, and sometimes those issues start creeping up and they want to talk about them. Um, 
can you think of some other instances where those kinds of things might come up? Family dysfunction that tends to get magnified as mom or grandma boy begins to decline and they have to make more choices on their care. <laughs> the dysfunction when you have four children and they are all listed as health care proxy and they don't agree. Huh. Oh boy. It's a, nightmare. it's a nightmare. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely a nightmare. Um, or worse yet is to watch the family where the mom was the matriarch and held everything together and she's now passed away. Oh, I'll tell you, there was one funeral in particular. I'll never forget. I got over to the funeral home and I just nonchalantly says, well, I see everybody's on staff today or, you know, everybody's uh, here. And they said, yeah. And we all have a cell phone in our pocket uh, ready to call 911 should the need arise. That was the staff at the funeral home. Uh -huh. I was like, say what? And they said, well, let's just say a uh, gun was mentioned during one of the interviews. Okay. What am I walking into? And it was a side of the family I had never seen before, um, you know, at Hilltop. But apparently there were some family members who never visited mother in the nursing home who now wanted to take charge of the funeral service. Like, wow, wow. And it was mom, the matriarch, who kind of hid all that and kept it all together. And now she's gone. I had the, I had the instance when I'm preparing power of attorney. Okay. And I have two children. And they all pretty well get along. Not totally unusual, but they do. And so I, my daughter who works in the financial field is getting to be power of attorney. And the only way I could convince myself as well as the other all of them is that she knows what she's doing and your children don't hate each other. That's what she said to me. I thought, I'm sure that I'm not the only one that has multiple children, but you gotta only pick one. Right. You can only pick one. But I've told my mom, I says, name me as your healthcare proxy, but leave the finances for one of the other two. I don't care which, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was actually just going to say that finance is also I mean, sort of mom's, you know, mom's inheritance and so forth. People get nervous about. Oh, yes. Parents, oh, my goodness. Um, when I first started at Hilltop and probably when you first started working in healthcare, uh, elder care, three years is what they looked back on your finances. Yeah. It's now five years. Five. Um, so if you're going to turn a house over to, uh, a ch to your children, do it five years before your, uh... <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow, five years. Um, our folks pretty much are guaranteed that once they're accepted into Hilltop, they will be able to live there. But that's providing they haven't given their money away recklessly. Um, and people say, well, my mom always wanted that money to go to me. And it's like, well, yeah, but that money's there for her care for as long as she's alive. Um, that means there may not be any money left at the end. And you know what? That's okay. Because when you consider what the trade-off is, the trade-off is the, the person who's got the money dying younger or do you want your mother's presence, your mother or father's presence for as long as possible? And, you know, it's, do you want the money? Do you want the love? You know, it's. My mother was all worried about things she had put in her will, go to certain groups that she was fond of. And uh, I don't know how many times she said it. What, what's going to happen when I can't fulfill my will? Well, there was no problem. I mean, she had enough money at, in the time she lived in the nursing home, she went through the amount that her house had brought in. Never touched anything else. So wow. she was all good, but she sometimes don't they, don't, they don't know. No, you don't know. You know, you I know, know what my will says, but you know, I'm not sure I'm going to know it. We had a resident who moved in at, a, at 95. Uh, who knew that she was going to live there 10 years? Yeah. <laughs> you know who knew Lee, i'd like to mention on um, something kind of going backwards in um, your presentation when you talk about um, people who 
become maybe anonymous, but yeah, you know, didn't know them when they were uh, high functioning and so forth. And I remember I'd heard a very young person say, and it was a staff member say at a different facility, not the Methodist homes, say, um, <laughs> These old people, all they do is they live in the past. They're living in the past. And I said, well, I don't have any scientific evidence, but you know, you know why? Because they don't like living in the present. And they are no longer independent, high-functioning, decision-making people. So to talk with them and review who they were, what they did, um, is, is a very important thing. So the living in the past um, I felt was kind of demeaning to the way it was said, it was very definitely demeaning, but yeah, you live in the past because that's when you were vibrant. That's when you were that introducing yourself as I was a teacher. Yes. And they're afraid of the future. I might add through, throw that into afraid of what, you know, how much longer have I got? We all know that death comes eventually, but do and I really want to seen, think about it? And we've all seen people who just were not comfortable. And most people are afraid of the pain of an uncomfortable or painful or lingering illness that could cause death. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think that fear, you know, the fear of, of, of what comes after death is much more pronounced when you're 85 than when you're 25. You may die at 25, but you probably haven't spent a long time thinking about it. At 85, you may be thinking of not much else. Potentially, yep. Um, the other one is the, the, the need for the worship, the group worship. The hardest part for me during COVID was not being able to reach the folks on the late stage dementia unit. You know, they're the ones where being able to read the weekly newspaper really was not a possibility. And I wasn't physically permitted into the nursing home for two full years. Um, so my connection with them was much less. However, I, I do remember my ordination service or ordination uh, interview, even before all of COVID before of anything is why do you waste your time? Notice the word waste your time offering worship on the dementia unit. It's not like they remember. Well, and I, you know, my answer is, okay. So how many worship services have you been to in your lifetime? How many of them do you remember? <laughs> Probably not all of them. Okay. How many meals have you eaten in your lifetime? How many meals have you remembered? But do you need all those meals to remain healthy and well throughout your lifetime? Oh, yeah. Do you need that continual worship to remain spiritually healthy and well? Absolutely. Whether you remember them all or not. You sing in the worship services? Oh, absolutely. I was going to say, I've heard you sing. So <laughs> I, I played for, until COVID, I played for the dementia unit at so on the South West Park. Uh -huh. And those people love to sing. Oh, yes. And I would not tell them what I was going to play. And by the time I'm four measures in, they're singing. I was going to say that long. And they know all the words. They, that's yeah. exactly. Yeah. They know. Start the Lord's Prayer. Oh, yeah. Start the Lord's start Prayer. Start the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's prayer. Right. That's right there. They, they, knew, they knew all the words. I'd sometimes say something like, oh, there's a color in the title of this. And they, you could see them sitting there thinking, what color could it be? Red sails in the sunset or something. Mm -hmm. But one day I played for an hour. And I'm walking down the hall. And they're walking down the hall because they're going to go to the whatever the next thing is. And this woman says to me, aren't you the woman that plays the piano? I said, yep. And she, and I said, and I just did. Was I there? Oh, there you go. Was I there? <laughs> yep. You were right in the front row. <laughs> now I'm, I probably could ask you, what are the five most commonly requested hymns? And I'll bet you come up with all five. I bet you we sang one of them today. Yeah. 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 Amazing yeah. Grace. Sure. Yeah. 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 Amazing Grace. Old Rugged Cross. Old Rugged Cross. In the garden. In the garden. In the garden. You got the top four. There you go. I could sing those over and over and over and over, and nobody would ever get tired of them. And I know you've talked so many times uh, that when you do like five worship services on Christmas Eve, 
that the dementia units, you basically just sing the familiar carols, but they want the story from Luke. Yes. Because that's the one they all remember. Yep. And even if I use a simplified version uh, for the, the, the service, well, not necessarily King James, but they want to hear unto you is born this day in the city of David, <clears throat> you know, and most of the, well, I guess you want to say children's Bibles don't necessarily have that phrasing. So I'll make sure that it's in there um, because that's the things that ring in their ear the most. So um, how does music fit into this spiritual needs of the elderly then to continue that thread? Oh, absolutely. If I, if I had a worship service without music, it wouldn't be a, a worship service. It wouldn't. Music is one of the things that touches the soul in a way that nothing else does. Yeah. Yeah. What about, what about providing music for people individually in their rooms to help them out with that? Is that something that's important for them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, our, our activities department, particularly with somebody who's uh, nearing death and we know it, they will provide a either radio or tape player and find out what kind of music they've listened to through the years and play that. We had one younger dementia resident who, uh, Patsy Klein, anything Patsy Klein. And so in her room, we would have Patsy Klein on. Um, I've seen there's one resident now, she's almost always got her television turned to the music station on the TV. Uh, now that Spectrum does that. Um, so finding out what people have enjoyed through the years makes a huge difference in their well-being. Yeah. And it may be hymns, it may not be. It may be classical music, it may not be. It may be the big band era. It may not be. You can't, I noticed that when I was doing that on a regular basis, I push, push along into the books that I use. 1960, done. <laughs> Nobody knows the Beatles, Puff the Magic Dragon. What? <laughs> but anything before that, they know all the words. Isn't that interesting? I, I, and I've said time and time again, I wonder what they're going to play when I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> well, after that discussion about it's going to be Puff the Magic Dragon. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be um, well, Beatles and, and stuff from the 60s and on. Which yeah. Mine's going to be Brandenburg Concerto. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll just we'll just line up the entire works of J.S. Bach for you. Yeah, there or, you go. The Four Seasons. <clears throat> oh, we'll we'll start like um, in there too. Um, one of the things when you're talking about people remembering the, the lyrics, um, are are people who have had a stroke and the speech has oh, affected. Yes. I had a man who um, was who that had happened to. And he had a friend who came to visit on a regular basis. And the friend would come and wheel him around in the wheelchair. And the friend would start singing. Well, the resident was not able to speak. But he sang every single word of a song. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, wow. I've heard that people can even go farther than that. And mm -hmm. if, they try, if they can't talk, they'll be able to sing what they want to sing. Yes. Sometimes that's true. I mean, you'll even hear of some actors who stutter when they're not acting, but as soon as they get on stage, that stuttering clears right up. Yeah, so it's amazing how music or cadence can, can bring some of that back. A lot of people who sometimes stutter don't stutter when they sing. Mm -hmm. it touches, it touches them deeply. <laughs> For you have been my hope, O sovereign Lord. My yeah. confidence yeah, since my youth. <laughs> From birth, I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. I have become like a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. Thank you.